Cavite flies under the radar. Just 40 kilometers away from Manila, it is mostly known for being the province of Tagaytay. However, dig a little deeper and you will find a treasure trove of heirloom dishes and culture. In this episode, we will revisit the province through its food, from some of the best longanisa in the country, to the much-loved bibingkoy. This is one of my favorite stops before. Yeah, exactly. And it's so it's delicious. A carenderia with a dizzying variety of dishes, and the Tres Marias of Cavite, a tripe carecare, adobo seca, and kilowing papaya. These are some of the best bites you can have in Cavite. Cavite has seen a lot. Before the Spanish, it was already an important trading area due to its geography. It then became the most important port during the Manila-Acapulco galleon trade, hence why people here spoke the Spanish Creole Chabacano for the longest time. It was attacked multiple times by the Dutch, the British, amongst others, because of its strategic military position and was eventually the forefront of the Spanish Revolution. This tragic history shaped the people and the food that you can still find here today. Each time I go to Cavite, I make sure to give Ige Ramos a call. Cookbook author, staunch cultural worker, culinary historian, food anthropologist, and true Caviteño. His work traces Cavite's history through its dishes, geography, and products, and is something I truly believe that all provinces could benefit from. We started off at Malin's, where Ige used to start his food tours, a family-owned restaurant that displays the province's history on its walls. He worked with the owners of the restaurant to create a breakfast platter that showcases some of the best produce this area has to offer. So tell me why is this kind of like the first stop for your food tour? Well, breakfast is the most important meal of the day, right? It is. So uh, we curated this breakfast. It's called the Magdiwang Breakfast. Mm -hmm. And it features the different products of Kabit. So you have tinapa from Salinas, from mm -hmm. Rosario. Then you have the longanisang imus. I remember that being yep. so delicious. Exactly, yeah. right? Originally, we would have like have this as tapang kabayo. Okay. But uh, it's beef tapa from Noveleta. Can you still find tapang kabayo here? Uh, very rarely. It's okay. so hard. Like you have to go to the hippodrome and buy a horse. <laughs> A little difficult, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the scrambled egg is quite special because it's made with burung mustasa. Burung mustasa is one of our fermented products that's been used a lot in our, in our, you know, like recipes. Mm -hmm. Begin. So, so all the I, all all the scrambled eggs is with the burung mustasa. Yes. Okay. So what I want to achieve here is uh, we can go uh, visit one. Uh, like one establishment and then you experience the different um, products of Cavite in one sitting. You know? But they were always championing here in local products? Also oh yes, yes, here. yes, yes. It's very important now because you help the local artisans, you yeah. have the local farmers. And it develops a sense of pride also. Pride and sense of community, yeah, yeah. sense of belonging. So we have two beverage here, which is uh, very, very common in the province. So you have coffee from Amadeo. Then, the coffee uh, here always has like a sense of a certain smoothness to it, which I really like. Mm. And it's really kind of like mm. nutty, vanilla right, in terms yeah. of flavor. And then of course we have uh, cacao and the chocolate um, is actually from Alfonso. So you have to try this. So, it, um, nice. so as a cultural worker, it's a very, very important for me to, to, to investigate, to research all these food ways and put it all together. Sometimes you have to view the food through the lens of an anthropologist. For sure. I mean, a lot of the work for, that you've done is, is really kind of tying history with the food that we're left mm -hmm. with today Correct. and those that have disappeared, right, mm -hmm. as well. So why is, why is Cavite, Cavite so rich? when it comes to ingredients? Well, because, you know, first of all, uh, during the Spanish period, uh, Cavite was a, a totally an agrarian community that supplies the food to Manila. We develop all these crops of oppression, like coconut, sugar cane, and rice, and, you know, all the vegetables, the salts coming from Cavite as well. Uh, seafood, a lot of seafood comes from Cavite. It's very, very rich, but however, during the Spanish period, there's so much oppression, so Cavite is like one of the first provinces who revolted against Spain. 
I always enjoy going to the Cavite City Market. It's well organized and showcases all the products in this area. Before meeting Ege, I never really thought of the idea of terroir in the Philippines. Terroir is the direct environment that influences agricultural products. To put it simply, the flavor of the ingredient is dictated by where they are made, and this is something that you can see put in display in the market. So this is the bakalao area. This is actual bakalao. Yeah, this is uh, la bahita. This is what they use for bakalao. You want to try it again? Uh, yeah, actually. Ige, Ige brought his own forks. So I had this before, but haven't had it again since since we last came here. Exactly. This one's not made in Cavite City, right? It's made in General Trias, yeah, so where uh, there's uh, abundance of carabao, and they okay. collect uh, carabao's milk. How far is that from here? Uh, 40 minutes? About, uh, yeah, 40 minutes, okay. yeah. Hi, hello. Hey, hi. I'm Erwin. Like in the market, you can actually see the influence of Mexico. Yeah. So, of course, like in, in recent studies, you know, Casillo is not really Mexican, but right. they assume the name. But actually, it's a deeper, more ancient background because Casillo is also done in Sumatra. Correct. And, you know, like Sumatra was like part of the Galleon trade, yeah. you know. And then, of course, like you have, you have tamales. I mean, talking about Mexico. So, Ate Ellen brought us some um, tamales. So, so Ate is, Ellen. So this is the same tamales we had last time. Yes. yes. And then you weren't yeah, there. It, that was your there. house. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, it's nice to finally meet you. Yes. You can see the uh, anato, achuete coming achuete, out. Achuete. There's peanut. The gift of Central America. Correct. To the Philippines. Wow. You eat it cold? Yeah, you eat it cold. Really? Yeah, yeah. Or, 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 Did we have it warmer or cold last time? Uh, it or was it depends. newly cooked. Yeah. Ah. I had no idea you can actually have it cold. Yes, oh, you okay. can. Yeah. Mm. You can. Still as good as ever. It's really good. <laughs> what I love about this particular tamales is just the amount. The amount of peanut. The amount of peanut. That's more it. than the galapong. Yes. Because if you go to like Pampanga, more there's rice. more more galapong. Correct. Than the palabok. Yeah. So the palabok style of this is what I really enjoy. The last time we were here, we went to Aling Ikas, a local giant in the market. She started selling bibikoi, a glutinous rice kakanin, which is like a mix of buchi and ginataang, before the Japanese occupation. When Aling Ika passed, her daughter Aling Lolit continued the legacy to everyone's delight. Unfortunately, Aling Lolit recently passed and the family has decided to temporarily close the stall, but one of their employees still makes it in front of it, a nod to the importance of this dish in this community. Hi, Chai. Hi, Po. So she still makes bibingkoi. Okay. So for people who don't know, what is bibingkoi? Okay, bibingkoi is essentially made like buche. It's uh, palitao, if you understand what palitao is. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard to... Put to into put, words, yeah. Yeah, put into words, you know, considering I'm a food writer. <laughs> so this is uh, made from glutinous rice. And... Um, and then inside it is a uh, cooked uh, mongo. Mm. It's uh, very sweet. And then it's cooked like bibinka style. There's uling on top and uling, at the, like embers are uling at the bottom. Correct. So it's called, that's why it's called bibinkoi. So at first I thought it was like unique to Cavite, but basically it's based on, and on my research, this is essentially very, very similar to Tao Yuan, but it has, um, Mm. Sago, there's little gabi, there's bilo bilo. Bilo bilo is um, another form of uh, like a glutinous rice. rice bowl, yeah. And, and langka. And then sometimes they put pandan as a flavor. It's like a beautiful mashup. Yeah, it's a beautiful, yeah, it is, yeah. So, so this is my childhood food. Yeah. So when my mom goes to the market, she would leave me here at the stall of Aling Ika. So I eat all the food here. Then eventually she com comes back with the produce and then I go home with her. Over there. It's actually really sad to see it close up, so hopefully... I hope, hopefully you that... know, like, I'd, I'd like to make an appeal to the family <laughs> to open it again. Yeah. This is one of my favorite stops before. Yeah, exactly. And it's so delicious. Hi, Bo. May pansit. Malabon. 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 Yeah, the Diniguan last time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. he remembers. Remember, right? It's very good. Wow, very good. So this is your typical uh, Karinderia fare. Mm. Ah, this is the 
This is the noodle they use. Ah, it's okay. a extruded steamed galapong. So we here we have they call it malabon. No, uh, it's, it's, it's like actually a... pancit palabo. Okay. Uh, what's special about this is the noodles to this day is done fresh every morning. It's the sauce is made from a uh, pounded shrimp's head. You know, the, mm -hmm. it's called dikdikin. Mm -hmm. you know? So the shrimp that you cannot like sell anymore. You use for flavor. I, I think the chicharron sa uh, yeah, it's pork. Mm. Yeah. Try Very it. nice. These these eateries here have been here for. For a long time now. Decades, yeah. right? Yeah, decades. Like Aling Miling is actually related to Nyora Ika. Okay. They're like cousins. So so you have like like family run carinderias here in Cavite. We'll go to another carinderia. Okay. Where they serve a really, really good Cavitanya fare. By this point I was stuffed, but Ige mentioned that we shouldn't leave without trying pats. It has a mango Try jam. Ooh, so, nice. so very it's a very uh, Maria Y. Orosa. Mm. Mm. So it has that old school feel. This reminds me of the, the cakes when I was young. <laughs> exactly. Grandma's house. Exactly. So it remained for the last uh, how many years? Um, so you say, because it's. Is... It's pats. Because it's in Tandani, Aling Pat. It's but Aling Pat would be a hundred now, no? Mm. Yeah. Oh. 70s, 70s now, yeah. Okay. Yeah, during the height of uh, uh, the, the American base. Japan. Sangli Point. Yes. What I love is that you never, you walk past here, you think, okay, you know, you're, we're all used to local panaderias and stuff yeah. like that, but to find like, this is a really good cream puff. Very like, sophisticated. Yeah, very sophisticated. <laughs> it's a very, I mean, like in the French tradition exactly, of a patisserie yeah. or boulangerie. I love or... it. Any other day I would have walked past this place. Without, and you wouldn't know. Without yeah. having taken a second, second look. Exactly. Um, this exactly. is an awesome find. Exactly. Now let's try the ube and saimada. So if you watch our previous video, you'll see that we actually talked about this style of ensaimada, which is kind of like, the more original style from Spain mm -hmm. that kind of inspired the smaller ensamadas that we have here. Do you put cheese also? Yes, okay, cheese also. Don't drop the cheese, remember right. the last That's time. That's the best part, I know. <laughs> After the market, we went to the diocesan shrine of Our Lady of Solitude of Porta Vega, or the San Roque Church. After being colonized by the Spanish in the 1500s, they built a Nipa chapel here. The legend goes in the 1700s, a ship whose patron saint was Saint Roque docked for repairs and they temporarily moved the saint's statue to the chapel. When the workers told their captain that they could no longer move the statue, they decided to leave it here. The 400-year-old painting of the Nuestra Señora Soledad de Porta Vega was first enshrined to the Ermita de Porta Vega chapel, but when it was destroyed in World War II, the painting was moved here as well. A reminder of the tumultuous past of Cavite sits in these walls. Just like any other place in the country, around the church, you can usually find some of the best food. So we headed next door to Regal Dining. I'm good, yourself? Are you eating at this place? Yes, yes. So they're one of the parang early calendarias here. So you clearly know Dina? Oh yes, <laughs> Dina's husband was my classmate in high school. And uh, Dina is a long-time caterer. She sort of inherited this uh, from her mom, uh, her talent for cooking. Oh, nice. And now it's uh, one of the best-selling carinderias here in Cavite. How long has this been here? Is it oh God, like for donkey's years. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the the carinderia is nicely situated. It's right in next the, to the church. Next to San Roque Church. Yeah, I think there's a certain sophistication in carinderias that people don't necessarily give them credit for. Exactly. It's not easy putting out 30 dishes. 30 dishes in one go. Keeping them, yeah. making sure they come out. And yeah. like you said, there's probably a certain seasonality to it. Correct. In terms of ingredients, what's Correct. available, coming up with that. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. And then, and then, more importantly, feeding a very diverse palate, right? Correct. Making everyone happy with the classics, but also local food. Yeah. So what's amazing about Cavite is, um, you know, you can consider it as a, it's a cosmopolitan city because 
a lot of uh, different, um, you know, like people would come here to work. Uh, we have a big uh, naval base and an air force base. Right. So they also bring with them their food waste, like the Ilocanos, the Ilongos, and they sort of like share their food and their food preference. So it reflects in the Carinderia. That's why the, this Carinderia, they have like Bicol Express, and you have adobo. Like now what we're having is uh, Paxiu na Lechon, and you match Paxiu na Lechon with uh, Dangit. Dangit or Which is tuyo. a combo I've never seen before. And of course, like Tahong is uh, very abundant in Bacoor Bay, in Manila Bay. And people would say that, uh, I don't want to eat tahong in Cavite because you know there's red tide. It's dirty, I mean, there's I don't no know, yeah. there's no red tide for the last twenty years. Yeah, it's a stigma. Yeah. There's a stigma, but uh, people still you know like eat tahong, you yeah. know. And of course, like we have torta. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have like that selection of torta now. But uh, but this is like a form of torta. But this is ukoi. Ukoi, yeah. yeah so yeah, yeah, yeah. try it. It's very different from any ukoi. I've, I've, it I mean, is. I'm used to ukoi that's shredded. Shredded. This is very dense. It's chunky. Chunky and dense. So this is Arnel Beruete, he's a foremost Chabacano poet. <laughs> he's a good friend of mine, he was my batchmate. And this is Chimboy, Chimboy. Okay. Bautista. He's uh, the former hospital administrator. And together with uh, his wife, Tita A, Tita his, Agnes. His partner. <laughs> partner. Very, very good friend who kept the culinary fire burning on the home-cooked Cavite cuisine. So, even if my, my mom is gone, I can still come back here and eat the, the food that I grew up, grew up eating. eating. What's in front of us here today? Uh, the Tres Marias. Tres Marias. The Adobo Secna. The Chilomin Papaya. Beautiful. Beautiful. And you're saying so it's not kare kare here, it's, it's kari. 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 Why is that? Actually, it's uh, when you talk to an, an old timer here. Old timer. Old timer here. What's uh, what's your food for today? It's curry. Curry. Curry in Bagoong. Right now we call it kilawin papaya, but before it's called kilawin librillo. 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 It's because of the um, because uh, that's part. It's of a it? tribe. Ah, uh, okay. The, the, it's, it's like it a looks book. like a small book. It's a standalone ulam. It's part of the trinity of curry, adobo seca. And uh, yeah, so, and of course, like the bagoong, and um, it's cooked with miso and grilled pancreas. Wow! Yeah. Okay. So, that's elaborate. So what? Yeah, it's a very, very elaborate dish. I couldn't even cook it, and it's not too spicy. So essentially, you grill the pancreas, pound it, and then you make visa. The you saute the bawang, the ahos, together with the miso the sibuyas, and then you put the, the pancreas, essentially. Yeah. So, kilawin is cooked, kinilaw is raw. Okay. And then, um, our kare kare is uh, kara, mukha, the, the, the chick, the yeah. face, and uh, mindongo. Tualia. 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 Yeah. Yes. Tualia. The karikare, kare, I mean the kari, sorry. Kari. No, looks, it's okay. Kari looks, looks beautiful. Um, and also the adobo seca. And then the adobo seca is pork and it's no, normally cooked with patis, vinegar, and achuete. Achuete. So similar to the ilongo adobo, which is achuete heavy. You have all these kind of like pieces of history that reflects that Spanish influence, the importance of the Chavacano language, but why is it a language that's slowly being spoken by less and less people in Cavite. Yeah, because there's a lot of um, mass migration, like leaving the country uh, or leaving the city for greener pastures. Like uh, you have uh, a lot of Caviteños living now in San Diego or in West Virginia. And then like there's a, an influx of people coming from the provinces. So the lingua franca has changed from Chabacano. Instead of them learning Chabacano, Tagalog is more widely spoken. Yeah. How Chabacano developed over time, because uh, 
Cavite was like uh, part of the galleon trade, it's the anthropod. So you have to develop a certain language where everybody can understand each other. So it started as a uh, lengua de la tienda, lengua de la mercado. It's a market language. It's a market language and lengua de la cocina. Yeah. So food played a very important role in the development of the language. That's why all the names of our food are in either in Spanish or in right. Chibacano. The adobo seca looks amazing. Yeah. Yeah, it came once it was on the table. I could smell it. The whiff it. of uh, ito. Mm. Pasado. 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 <laughs> Very good. This curry, by the way, is the, the sauce is next level. The peanuts are really nicely roasted mm -hmm. and gives so much character to the whole dish. And in Tawel, yeah, it's so nicely cooked. So this is what we serve on Sundays so to good. the family. Family lunch. And I love the addition of the fresh vegetables. Mm. Wow. After our bellies were filled, Arnel indulged us with some of his Chabacano poems. We finished off our tour with a visit to the Aguinaldo Shrine and Mansion. Even though Aguinaldo is an extremely complex historical figure with questionable actions towards what he sought as independence, this estate remains one of the few historical monuments in the country which carries the baggage of our colonized past. So I asked you the last time we did the video, remember I asked you what were your hopes, hopes. for Filipino cuisine and Filipino culture? I think uh, a lot of young people now are, are, are aware of um, the Philippine gastronomy because I'm not just talking about cuisine but I'm talking about gastronomy in general because you have to understand that cuisine is only a part of gastronomy but gastronomy is the all-encompassing discipline that fuels the terroir, food identity, the geography, the relationship of trade and people, and the terroir, and the identity, and the ethno-linguistic groups coming together. You can actually form a more cohesive ideal when you talk about Filipino food. My job is to put things together in perspective and viewing it through the cultural lens of the very people that practice it. Yeah, I think, you know, nowadays people just need to be interested. Yeah. There's so many facets, like you said, to Filipino cooking, to Filipino ingredients. Yes. A lot of the times it feels like a losing battle just because yeah. there's so many conversations Correct. to be had, so many provinces to visit, so many people yeah. to talk to. But I think if people kind of just sat down, took the time to kind of get to know their own provinces yeah. first a little bit and then yeah. expand. Their own barangay first. Correct. Yeah. And then expand your perspective, expand your reach. Yeah. Then maybe we'll be able to fly the flag a bit higher because we all know gastronomy yeah. is kind of like the first foot into yeah. like presenting ourselves internationally and people yeah. understanding our food. And the more popular food becomes, the more people will be interested to travel to yeah. the country just like Thailand has done uh, previously. Yeah. I mean, you know, like you have to bear in mind that uh, like what Carlo Pet Petrini said in the past, Gastronomy is the only science that can measure happiness. So if you can measure happiness and then the happiness quotients of the people and then, you know, like if everybody's fed, everybody is, you know, uh, satisfied. satisfied, no one's hungry. And then that's the only time we can say that we are a truly free nation. Mm.